do startups do in order to scale circular solutions and also why they are so relevant to accelerate the transition. <laughs> circular economy itself is not really new, um, which like, yeah, is probably sometimes a striking thought considering how hyped this has been in the last like, 10 years. But this is a, a citation from Kenneth Boulding from the 1950s, 60s, in which the ideas of uh, finite resources on our planet basically really came to life. So before that, we were really extracting and using as we could. In the 50s, 60s, we started realizing, okay, you know, we don't have everything on this planet to an, an, a crazy end. So, you know, only, as he says it, only uh, madmen or economists would be the ones who believe in, in like, infinite growth. Um, so, you know, we started seeing also, like, a key publication here was Spaceship Earth. Um, so really seeing the planet as a spaceship, and we have to make it fly or last as long as possible. Um, and this really yeah, ignited the thoughts of circular thinking or systems thinking also where, where yeah, loops can be embedded. Um, unfortunately, only ignited it, but it didn't really um, start a fire that happened over, over the second half of the, the last century. But essentially, you have a few kind of illustrations here. Um, yeah, economics really were dominant. Um, the policy landscape was very neoliberal, neo-capitalistic. So essentially, markets were determining what kind of resources flew over the world. So what could be sold uh, and could be brought to any place could essentially be produced as long as it was legal. Um, but really, we lost a bit of the connection to the actual roots of, of what we do, which is like still largely the case today, right? Like, what do we eat? What do we stand on? Where is it all coming from? Essentially, we didn't really know um, how this was put together and further, further lost touch to it. Um, that's essentially what happened over yeah, the second half of the 20th century, the 60s, 70s. We started a bit looking into what do we do with all the waste, but not really into prevention, into reducing resource input in the first place, into um, yeah, those more high-impact strategies to avoid uh, or build a sustainable future. So recycling became a bit of a thing, but it really didn't thread the needle. Unfortunately, uh, even though circular economy and all sustainability became such an important topic over the last uh, 10, 15 years, um, it didn't really uh, thread the needle until today. So um, this number here is from a large report that was basically done yeah, by an Amsterdam-based organization, Circle Economy, mapping out the resource flows of our world, and we see that less than 10% of resources are actually being um, recycled. And this is obviously largely driven by the corporate world in that sense, um, and this number is actually even stagnating or uh, decreasing rather than growing. So we have really a problem here. We, we do not manage to move our systems collectively to higher efficiency and higher, higher uh, resource utilization. You see a few of the reasons here. So the, com the design choices become more complex. You know, when you build a product that should be you know, modular or m allow easier maintenance in the service uh, uh, model later on, um, the, yeah, the value creation becomes more mutual. So, you know, you don't just sell your product, but you now have to think about, you know, sharing a bit of your pie with your customers, sharing it with other actors along the value chain. Um, and that makes it obviously more complex. Uh, and also the power balance, you know, think of sharing models, for example, where we have much more transparency about the offer. We can, you know, use, instead of booking a hotel, use rooms from others. So, you know, the, the, the corporate world is you know, struggling to keep up with those challenges. Um, a big topic as well, and I guess also in the built environment and design, is you know, new material uh, categories and product standards, uh, not only in design and built environment, but also in consumer products. Think of used phones or used fashion. You read, you know, this is you know, grade A, grade B, or it's used, highly used, you know, not so much, but we basically don't really have an understanding you know, when it comes to second or third uh, life cycles of products, what the real quality is, and we are far from standards in that context. Very challenging and uh, mostly applying to large established solutions and value and supply chains. So what we did, we looked more into startups because these are actually the organizations that build circular or sustainable models oh, sorry, uh, from scratch. So they can monetize them from scratch. They can already take care that they have you know, good utilization of byproducts. So we looked into what they're actually doing, but not only into the innovations and technological progress they are creating, but also into the systemic interactions. So how do they build, essentially, um, systems around their solutions so that customers understand it, that regulation allows it, that supply chain partners are willing to share the value with them. And here you see f a few of the examples. Like we had a, uh, looked more than into 180 startups but also, I would also highlight the funding that's happening here. So you see this always in the little gray box on the top, meaning 
that you know they reach scales and also levels of you know the modern tech uh, Silicon Valley Berlin uh, startup world in terms of the funding and also in terms of the attention. Um, various solutions to mention here. This obviously for for today probably very relevant. Um, building materials for mycelium. Lots of cool other things that can be done with that. Um, but also yeah, we talked about what can be done with rooftops and vertical farming. Important for transforming um, urban areas as well. Um, or, m or even reusable batteries, which I find still kind of flashy that you can p fully reuse a battery and recharge the core. So these are solutions that yeah, really um, are built by startups in a way that they are already working, that they are partly even break even. Um, and most importantly, um, and that's what I want to talk about today, they also started to build a system around those. So we started mapping that um, in terms of the key stakeholders for the startups. You see here on the left, mm, no, nothing surprising, but what are the interactions with those which are more relevant, which are less relevant, and then also the institutional infrastructure that they were exposed to. So not only, you know, I talked about regulation, consumer behavior, norms, values, beliefs, what are they doing to really change something here? Um, and we built this out you know, for 120 of our startups that we had in our database, analyzed, or so interviewed also 80 of them. Founders like, you know, Metropolda was in there, so <laughs> great to uh, see, see some dots con being connected here, also concrete. Um, so it was, was yeah, quite the extensive uh, task to understand what are these startups actually doing. And this is then what I yeah, also want to wanna, uh, uh, yeah, take you or have you taken away in terms of, you know, if you're a startup or if you're building or trying to scale a circular solution, what are the activities that are relevant for that? What we found were the reinforcers. So these are the ones that empower consumers, like also mapping of food sources in your environment. For example, lower your, um, your kind of uh, negligence of, of those to have access to those. So you might not go each time to the supermarket, but you're aware there's even stuff around you that maybe you have access to in a kind of gamified or app-based uh, way. Um, the example here from the built environment, uh, is Finch Buildings, I think they are in uh, Rotterdam as well. They have like a wooden, um, yeah, wood-based uh, construction uh, models. And what they did is with their consumers, they mapped the sound level and noise um, in their uh, neighborhoods in comparison to a classical construction site. Then probably the most important ones uh, for built environment, <coughs> sorry, are the conveners. So they connect supply chains. We had lots of examples here. You know, waste-based solutions are probably the ones that yeah, stand out the most. Um, so new bubbles, stone cycling, they use, I think new bubble do, does it with old plastic. Stone cycling at, uh, at least, I think, uh, similar to you guys, like 70, 75% of uh, recycling quotes in their products. Um, but also a water solution here, Pudro, which is like a, um, yeah, uh, an energy solution that maps leakage in large water system is like run by itself, uh, energized through the water, it goes through the pipes. They had to start working with municipalities, with software players and um, infrastructure actors to really connect the dots. And this means if they do it from scratch, that there's a lots of learning in there for corporates or other solution providers, or also cities that want to tr scale those solutions. Um, next would be the pioneers, so uh, we talked about the policy uh, implications, so this is probably one that gets closest to is um, There are startups that consciously and with a real purpose try to overstep lines, try to engage in like really gray areas of, um, of policy and regulation in order to set the direction. Because often policy is missing legitimacy, they don't often have a clear case to make against, you know, lobbyism, <laughs> uh, to say, okay, no, this is the direction, these are the thresholds to meet, these are the numbers that you, you should meet um, if you deploy such a solution. So startups recognize this and go a step further in those directions to give policy the power to argument and deploy policy instruments that drive this change. And then lastly, uh, probably even related to the event today, is the role modeling and the, the championing, um, especially since so many founders like, across our whole data set, uh, we saw that I think 30 or 40% of founders were designers or engineers. Um, but there's a high barrier in terms of entrepreneurship, and there's often a lack of management skills, so there's like a bias towards not becoming an entrepreneur, not funding a business, while it's super important because the skill um, is mostly coming out of there. Many of the f uh, startups are actually found out of um, in, uh, in university products, uh, projects. Um, so it's very important that founders 
interact. They do this also very consciously, of course, you know, to get talent, <laughs> which makes a lot of sense, but even, you know, to scale. So Boreal uh, Light is an example that builds um, water uh, desalination solutions, so taking the salt out of water, make it into drinkable uh, water. Uh, but they scale by allowing communities, similar to probably what we heard before, to own the, the respective infrastructure. So they share their entire knowledge, they don't do it in a proprietary way, but in an open innovation approach, and thereby also encourage talent to uh, participate in circular innovation. And I think you know, we have heard like already through the approaches from uh, the, the founders before, there's always like, some interaction. Of course, they're not mutually exclusive, but you know what I said before, you know, what I would really yeah, like you to go away with is when you think about it, when you think about circular solutions and how to scale them, whether you're a startup, see you know, how your activities map against this, but especially if it's a larger organization that tries to uh, set up a circular solution in their portfolio to try to act along those actions and not be locked in in the like, general business case and innovation agendas of, of, uh, of today that, you know, as we saw before, do not uh, drive the change that we need. Thank you very much, and yeah, <laughs> looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Marvin.